Hello. I think we are live. Yep. Great. Well, welcome. Um, we're going to get started here in about five minutes um, with the presentation this afternoon. So um, yeah, please stick around if you're if you're watching this live. Um, again, about five minutes. If you're watching this after the fact, feel free to just skip ahead. If you're watching the recording, no need to sit through that. Um, so it'd be about five minutes here. Let's get started at two o'clock. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to check. Yep. Okay. So it looks like the sound is good. Um, this is where I have to keep talking so that I can continue to hear myself just in case. So if I just talk like this, it's fine. Yep. Yep. Great. So um, yeah, thanks for for joining us this afternoon. Um, while we're we're waiting here, let me just take a moment to uh, thank thank our sponsors here. Um, oh, and I always forget to just switch this out. Uh, well, Yankee Bookstore is not only uh, sponsoring History Speaks, which is what our program is, but also our weekly history chats. Um, so big thanks to them for their support of local history and you know here in Marathon County. Um, as well as thanks to all of our members here at the Marathon County Historical Society. If you're not already a member and you're enjoying this the content we do and, and you know the history and you want to have an opportunity to, to help in that, as well as um, getting some, some benefits like our, our newsletter and things like that, some tour, oh, not doing tours at the Aki House at the moment, but you know at some point we'll get that back up and running. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're not already a member and you're looking for an opportunity to support us, that would be a great place to start. Uh, you can always go to our website here at uh, marathoncountyhistory.org, or you can actually just come, up, come in during the week here. We are open um, to the public, um, so give us a call or uh, come in and visit us in person if you want to. Um, but yeah, thanks to everybody for the support of the programs. Um, again, we're just going to get started in a couple minutes here. Oh, good. People are joining us. Okay, I guess I got through the sponsors faster than I thought I would. That's all right. Need a longer list. Yeah, we do need a longer list if you want to help us out with that, you know. We already do the uh, History Speaks on the Road. It's, it's all my parents. Uh, actually, it's our money. They didn't set up a, a fund for it, but uh, no. to use some of their uh, estate money to... To fund that. Yeah, that was great to get out in the community with those. We can do that again soon. Yeah, Maybe next. Program that you would like to do out in the county sometime. Uh, probably have a couple we could do. Glad yeah. to set you up. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Preference for Hatley, Athens, Stratford, Spencer, Edgar. Yeah, those are those are all places that you know. There's histories there and things like that. All right. Well, I think it's it's two o'clock. Um, you may, may have I don't know how well he's picking up because he's going through through my mic here. But um, I'm going to introduce to you our, our speaker of this afternoon, um, Rick Lar, um, and he's going to be telling you about his time um, in Poland and and telling about the history of Poland through that. So um, with that, take it away. Well, we snuck a trip into Poland just before COVID, so this is from 2019. And a little personal note, uh, I'm half Norwegian and half German until I did 23andMe. And my sister did uh, Ancestry. And uh, turns out that Grandma Warwak on the German side uh, must have been Polish because we both came out uh, a quarter Polish. So it uh, added to the interest in this trip. And I heard stories of her on the uh, down Prairie de Sac on the party line. And uh, her German was very good and her Polish was not as good, but she uh, had some Polish friends and when they didn't want the others on the line to understand, 
they would slip from the German or English into Polish, and uh, it's a story I hadn't known before. So with that, we'll start out with uh, our talk on, on Poland here, a very tragic and interesting place, that's for sure. I have a couple of quotes. Hail, O Christ, thou Lord of men, Poland in thy footsteps treading, like thee suffers at thy bidding, like thee too shall rise again. Kazimierz Zbrzezinski. Uh, Poland disappeared in history for a lengthy period of time. And uh, so this is one of the things that we noted on our trip, that that idea was, was uh, present in the minds of, of most, most Polish people. Uh, from a patriotic hymn, O God, who through the ages has girded Poland with power and fame, whose shield hath kept her in thy care from evils that would cause her harm, before thy altars we bring our entreaty, restore, O Lord, our free country. You can hear the desperation of people who want their country back. And uh, that's part of what we'll be talking about. History, Polish identity, and the Catholic Church were three of the main themes uh, that we saw on the trip. Poland has a population of about three, 38 and a half million. It is a member of the European Union and NATO. And we'll discuss that a little bit. And you're looking at the cousin of the Little Mermaid in, uh, the day in Copenhagen. Uh, this one uh, looks a little more defensive, and we'll talk about her as well. But that is the cousin, and uh, we'll see her again. The current president is Andrzej Duda. He's a conservative. Uh, he is not so sure about uh, the European Union and uh, NATO. He's questioning those. He uh, was a narrow winner. The country seems uh, split almost 50-50 between a more liberal and a very uh, conservative uh, autocratic kind of government that he favors. He has been accused of misusing state resources. I think uh, uh, it, uh, is, that's uh, maybe a common uh, attack. Uh, we, we would call it corruption. Xenophobia means he does not approve of uh, the refugees that uh, most uh, European nations uh, agreed that they would let into their country, and uh, he has opposed that. He's a homophobic, and he is anti-Semitic. So uh, uh, he has control of the media and the courts. So he is uh, uh, an autocrat, and he is governing through sidekicks who are uh, quite corrupt, and uh, his policy seemed to keep me to keep them satisfied with their corruption without letting them go so far as to lose the, uh, uh, the general population, the popularity of his administration with the general population. So what happened to Poland? It was partitioned in 1795, and that lasted until 1918. And it's uh, when the Lithuanian and Polish uh, Empire uh, it just uh, uh, it had become very weak and uh, under pressure, pressure from uh, Russia and Prussia and Austria, uh, the country uh, was in three different partitions, it disappeared. And uh, the final partition being in 1795. Uh, Poland's history has always been largely determined by its neighbors in war, having Russia as one neighbor and Germany as another, and the great Austria-Hungarian Empire as another. Uh, this is a small country that's kind of squeezed in between. So when it disappeared, Russia took over the section of the country that's pictured in red. And the uh, Russians did not like the Polish culture. They thought they should Russify it. They should teach Russian in the uh, schools and uh, make uh, the Polish Slavic people of, of Poland into Russians. Whereas in uh, Prussia, where uh, they became Germans, uh, the Germans were hostile to Polish culture as well. And so they would teach German in the schools and try to make the Polish people there feel like they were Germans. Whereas the Austria-Hungarian Empire had so many minorities, they could care less if the Polish people wanted to act like they were Polish. So uh, this is what happened for uh, that period of years. And uh, 
uh, until we get to 1919, World War One is fought. Uh, Soviet or Russia becomes the Soviet Union in 1917 and drops out of the war. Uh, the Germans uh, had taken uh, much of or most of uh, the Polish territory, were forced to withdraw. And so in the Treaty of Versailles, Poland is recreated. So there it is. It existed this way from 1919 to 1939. And how do you build a country now? And, you know, here you have this, these borders back together. And one part had been Russified to a degree. The other part had been uh, made into uh, uh, kind of Germany. And the other part was uh, more uh, traditionally Polish. So the big issue was how to bring that all together. And uh, the other issue was that uh, they didn't have access to the sea. So there was a German city named Danzig that uh, uh, was up on the Baltic uh, Sea coast, and uh, uh, they could use that as a free port. And how do you get to Danzig? That's is going right in between Germany and East Prussia, which is part of Germany. So it splits it. And uh, so this was made into what was called the Polish Corridor. The Germans hated that. They uh, didn't think the country should be divided by Poland. So now, as you get into the 1930s, you have Stalin becoming the leader, the dictator in the Soviet Union. And his statement, if you look over toward the Russia side, is Poland is not a real state. This is part of Russia. Uh, it should not exist. And on the other hand, if you look over by Germany, it says Poland was created from the blood of German soldiers. And the Especially the Polish quarter and the free city of Danzig are atrocities that uh, uh, must be corrected out of the result of World War I. So following World War II, and I know we're going through this very rapidly, but uh, uh, the Soviet Union took back part of Poland that they should have been Russia. So you see that in the pink on your screen. So they took that and drove the Polish people out of that area. But to compensate, they took East Prussia and uh, to the yellow on the other side of, uh, on the west side of, uh, of Poland. And for about 150 miles, they pushed uh, Poland west. And so the Polish people then very brutally, in many cases, as they were pushed out by the Russians very brutally by the Soviets, uh, pushed the, uh, the Germans out. And uh, uh, so you have a country that actually moves. We don't think of that very often, that a country can physically move, but Poland did. And uh, uh, it's so uh, here is the new, uh, the new Poland. A couple of the main figures that you might think of, and I know we always think of Poniatowski here in, in uh, Poniatowsk in this case, but uh, Poniatowski is a town west and north of Marathon City. Uh, you can go there and visit the uh, geographical mar marker that's there. It's one half of the way between the equator and the North Pole, and it's one half of the way from zero degrees longitude to 180 degrees longitude. So if you want to be in the center of things, you go to Poniatowski and uh, uh, you can really feel that. He was a Polish leader and general, minister of war and army chief with the French. He became a marshal in the French army. Why with the French? Because Napoleon said, oh, if I take that area back, we will make a Poland again. Oh, you know, this really excites some of these Polish leaders. So at the Battle of Leipzig, this is a fiery military man, and the army was told to withdraw. And he said, no, no, and he led a charge. And he should have gone with the, with the withdrawal because he was killed in the, uh, in the charge. And uh, so he died fighting for the French, but fighting for a free Poland as well. And then the other really uh, important uh, historical figure, King Sobieski, uh, was elected king in 1674, and he stopped the Ottoman Empire. These would be the Muslims from the uh, Middle East attack into Europe at the Battle of Vienna in 1683, and that was a notable battle. 
because here you can see the extent of the Ottoman Empire. It was a huge empire. And they were poised to move right into Europe, and the gateway was going to be Vienna. So King Sobieski brought his army down and met the Muslim army, the Ottoman Empire army, uh, before Vienna and defeated them. And if they wouldn't, uh, Europe was in such disarray, and uh, he had very little military uh, force. The thought was that maybe Islam would have conquered all of Western Europe, and the rest of uh, history would have been Islam rather than Western uh, Christianity. So here is the hetman, or the headman Sobieski, on his horse, and he is triumphantly tramping down the soldiers of the Ottoman Empire. You can see them underneath the horse's hooves, and he is saving the Christian West. How did he do it? Well, he had the famous wing hussars of the Polish army. They had lances, and they had uh, maces, and swords, and, and uh, they had uh, these wings up behind them. And uh, it's the Tatars, some of the people that they fought against, practiced uh, lassoing, the, throwing a lasso and, and pulling the, uh, uh, the cavalrymen off of their horses. Well, this prevented that. Also protected you from uh, the saber slash from the back. But also they rustled in the wind and created kind of a whistle that uh, bothered the uh, horses that they were attacking. And so that would uh, make them discomfortable and and uh, also with uh, the wings flapping and the, you can see the animal skins flapping behind made a ferocious uh, uh, appearance when they attacked. So they were almost undefeatable uh, until uh, gunfire and uh, different uh, weapon techniques uh, take them out. Their nickname was the Angels of Death, uh, very elite units. <clears throat> St. Florian Cathedral in Krakow. It's a reminder that Catholicism is very strong in Poland. About 86% of Poland's population is Roman Catholic, and that is the highest percentage in Europe. St. Florian himself uh, was a Roman general in the provinces, and uh, he refused to sacrifice to the Roman gods and to uh, make his soldiers, force his soldiers to do that. So he was arrested and tied up and he was going to be burned to death and he looked at the soldiers who were going to light the fire and said all right light that fire if you dare and nobody dared so they tied a uh, big rock around a millstone actually around his neck and uh, threw him in the river and he drowned but he became a saint and then when his relics his bones and relics were uh, put in a casket and driven north uh, they grew heavier and heavier as the trip went on, and when they got to this point, uh, the horses wouldn't go any further, so this is where St. Florence Cathedral was built in Krakow. It's played a pivotal role in Polish history, as you already understand. Kingdoms, dynasties, parties, regimes have come and gone. What's always remained of Poland has been the church. That has remained and that has carried the, uh, the Polish culture into the, uh, into the future. We went to uh, the Jasna Gora Monastery in Czestakova. The Pauline order there is the home of the Black Madonna. And you can see all the flags on the walkway up there. This is a place where pilgrims come all the time to see the Black Madonna of Czestakova. And, uh, when we were there, there was just lines and lines and lines of different kinds of tour groups. And uh, each of them had their uh, priest that was, uh, was leading them in this, uh, this pilgrimage. Also, uh, they celebrated the Polish Pope, John Paul II. Uh, John Carol Josef Wytyla. Uh, it's was Pope from 1978 to 2005, and a very, very substantial and consequential Pope he was. So here you see him in a very triumphal pose. Uh, he made a stand for human rights, and we'll be talking about him on that. He used his influence to bring about political change. And here you can see he's laying before the, uh, the Black Madonna. He has been uh, shot four times. 
get severe blood loss. I had not, I had read about it when that happened, but it is said he was very close to dying. His uh, would-be assassin was Muhammad Ali Akka, a member of the Grey Wolves, a Turkish far-right ultra-nationalist organization. He was an escaped murderer from Turkey. And uh, shortly after uh, Pope John Paul recovered, he went to the prison to uh, forgive his uh, would-be assassin. Uh, his would-be assassin was released a year or two ago. And the uh, first thing that he went out, he did, was to uh, uh, come to, uh, to Pope John Paul's uh, uh, graveside uh, to lay down flowers uh, at the graveside. So he wanted to talk to Pope Francis as well, but the uh, uh, source I read said they thought that was enough that he laid the flowers by the graveside. So no free Poland without Pope John Paul II. I think that's probably a correct uh, quote. Don't be afraid, he said when he went there. He traveled there, he's immensely popular. And again, you can see the, where his heart is, the, uh, the Black Madonna. Don't be afraid. Don't approve of the communist re regime is what he's talking about. The fa fate of Poland depends on you. He inspired the anti-communist movement called Solidarity, which was a union. And after victory, Solidarity, uh, Union hung his portrait over the shipyard gates in Gdansk. So 1956, King Jan Kazmierz proclaimed a vow to consecrate Poland to the protection of the Mother of God. And so the Black Madonna becomes the major symbol of that the consecration. And uh, the Polish government and Polish culture is still dedicated to that. This is the Black Madonna of Czeskoba. Why black? One of the theories that uh, the priest that was guiding us said, well, it may have been the uh, tie to the Mother Earth, Earth Goddess, the pagan background of Poland, where uh, the Mother Earth Goddess was, was uh, black. And uh, here the missionaries were trying to convince them of the uh, validity of the Christian church is, uh, is a valid religion, and what better way than to adapt the, uh, the mother goddess from the old religion and place her in, she was really uh, the Black Madonna, or it was the Madonna, not just a, uh, so there is a tie between the pagan religion and Christianity, and that of course was very successful. The monastery, uh, the Black Madonna, became symbols of the unity of Polish people, as we've said. There's our, our guide uh, standing there talking, really a funny guy and uh, very knowledgeable and it was a lot of fun on the uh, way through the monastery. So this is the coat of arms of the city of Warsaw. This is the cousin to the mermaid in Copenhagen. She's caught by a surly merchant while she was swimming in the Vistula. And she was rescued by a young fisherman. A young fisherman just happened to be really handsome. And uh, she really liked that area, a natural uh, area around, uh, uh, around Warsaw. And so she vowed to stay there and to protect Warsaw against all threats, therefore the shield and the sword. And uh, she has not been totally successful. She. Uh, Maybe should have had uh, some tanks and other things as well. This is the remains that we saw of the Warsaw Jewish ghetto wall. The Jewish ghetto was the largest in Europe. They had gathered Jewish people from all over the countryside uh, to bring them to uh, this ghetto in Warsaw. And uh, it was being, there were, there were railroad tracks built up to the ghetto and people were being shipped off to Auschwitz as it turns. And uh, uh, it's, it's, some spies found out what was happening. And so in 1943, uh, there was a desperate uprising of the, uh, the ghetto and they fought bravely. They brought in weapons uh, through the sewers and, and uh, from uh, Christians who were uh, favorable to the Jewish side and uh, fought. But uh, by 1943, uh, the ghetto is destroyed. So this is part of the original wall around that ghetto. Really tragic uh, incident in their history. 1944, Warsaw was deliberately annihilated. 
uh, is repression of the Polish resistance to the German occupation. Uh, the Soviet army had come up to the Vistula, which is right across the river from the capital city. And so the resistance rose in, in anticipation of the army invading, the Soviet army, and they were going to help. And uh, Hitler had no intention of allowing an organized military, capable military group exist in Poland. So instead of moving on Warsaw, he sat there and let the Nazi uh, army destroy the, uh, the resistance before they moved in. Uh, Hitler was so upset and so angry at the, uh, uh, the resistance uprising that he ordered that, that Warsaw should be destroyed before the, uh, the Germans left. And so uh, that's, that's what happened. So this is a monument to the resistance. These are soldiers coming up out of the, uh, uh, the sewers that they use for communications and transportation throughout the city. And like I said, uh, uh, they were uh, destroyed in the end as uh, Stalin just waited it out until they were. 85% of the old town square was destroyed by the Nazis during World War II. And, uh, so this historic city was absolutely in ruins. Here's the royal castle that's burning and destroyed by the German Nazis in 1944. Reconstructed from 71 to 88, funded by Poles at home and abroad. And this happened a lot in, in different parts of Poland. And here's a recognizable figure. Here's Dwight Eisenhower walking through the central parts of uh, Warsaw. And this is his quote, I have seen many towns destroyed, but nowhere have I been faced with such destruction. That's General Dwight Eisenhower. Well, you know, for him to say, I've never seen such destruction says a lot. So how do you rebuild a place when you don't have the old plans, when you, you know, uh, uh, it's, you uh, just kind of have memories? Well, fortunately, there was an Italian painter who had become just enamored of, uh, of Warsaw. His name was Bernardo Bellotto, and they took his paintings as guides and rebuilt buildings to look like his paintings. So current Warsaw is, you know, built as historic Warsaw, but it's really built as a vision of Bernardo Bellotto, an Italian painter, interpreting what he saw of this historic city. It's, it's really a, just an interesting uh, <laughs> uh, restoration, that's for sure. It's hard to imagine today that Warsaw, a city of 2 million people, is hardly 70 years old. It's just mind-boggling, actually. The War Construction Office was headed by Professor Professor uh, Zakwatzewicz, he was connected secretly to the Polish Home Army Underground. So he is secretly a Polish nationalist. And he is the only one to convince the Soviets to rebuild or restore a historic section of a town anywhere in the so that the Soviet Union took over. So Warsaw has that distinction. It's... Uh, uh, the only place the Soviet Union aided in restoring a historical spot. If you go out in the outskirts, of course, uh, Warsaw is continuing to build, but these are not historic looking buildings. They're also not funded by Polish people, mostly. These are mostly multinational corporation investments. They have the money, and of course, they're coming in building their glass skyscrapers, and, and so that kind of thing is happening as well. The Remu Synagogue in Krakow, the old German part of uh, the division of Poland that Germany absolutely considered to be German was not as destroyed as the rest of Poland was. So Krakow did not dis uh, suffer as much destruction as other parts of, of Poland. This uh, synagogue was founded in 1553. It's still active. 
but uh, the number of Jewish people living in uh, Poland is uh, now quite small. However, when we were there uh, in the cemetery, you could see some of the uh, of Polish people looking at some of the tombstones. This is the Pale of Settlement. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but uh, uh, back in the day, Russia conquered parts of Europe that had a lot of Jewish people. And so they decided to make a pale of uh, this area. In other words, an enclosed or fenced in or restricted area where Jewish people could live legally. They had certain restrictions. They couldn't live in certain towns and so forth. But uh, they did live here. As time went on and the growth of Zionism begins, uh, during World War I, neither side trusted their Jewish population. Who's, where did their loyalties uh, reside? And so pogroms and throwing people out of their villages should bring to mind Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, that is the story of the Pale. That's where these people were living. And uh, so when you see Fiddler on the Roof again, just realize that this is that area between Poland and, well, divided between Poland and Russia, in which Jews uh, could live legally, but uh, gradually losing those rights and uh, many of them having to flee, as in Fiddler, some of them going to Palestine and some going to the U.S. and other countries. And that leads us to Auschwitz, uh, the largest German concentration camp. Uh, that part of it was for those who could work, but it was also a mass extermination center for Jews. And uh, uh, in the years 40 to 45, 1 million 300,000 where people were let, uh, deported to Auschwitz, 1 million 100,000 were Jews. And uh, our Polish uh, uh, guide was emphasizing how many Poles went there too, but actually compared to the Jewish numbers, it, uh, that was uh, fairly small. 90% uh, of the people who were killed at Auschwitz were, were Jews. And uh, we also had the, the Roma and uh, Soviet prisoners of war and 25,000 prisoners from other ethnic groups that went through. So here's that famous uh, entrance into Auschwitz, Arbeit macht frei, uh, work makes you free. And uh, so you would march in here and if you were capable of work, that's what you would be set out to do. These were the uh, pre-war Polish army barracks. We were there uh, it's late autumn. And so you can see the leaves on the ground. It's quite beautiful with the brick uh, barracks and so forth, but it belied the reality of the, uh, of the institution. And you got that when you saw the electric fence, fence and the, of course the skull and crossbones halt. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, wires would be uh, electrified and, and certainly uh, you would be shot if you tried to get, uh, get through them. Uh, we had Henry Goldie from Merrill that would come and talk to our classes at Wassa West when I taught there. And Henry was not at Auschwitz, but he was at a different camp. And he had to uh, step outside to relieve himself out of the barracks. You weren't allowed to do that. And a guard grabbed him and said, now I've got you, and put him up against the fence, not electrified in this case, and brought him his rifle up and said, no, I'm going to shoot you. And another guard came along and said, your time is up. Uh, I'm here to relieve you. I'll take care of this. So the other guard left and this guard said, get back in there and don't ever try that again. Henry said he thought the reason that he survived was that he had blonde hair and blue eyes. That's certainly if he had dark hair and dark eyes, uh, he would have been shot. And uh, that's how, you know, just uh, arbitrary those rules were. The uh, guards could shoot you for Absolutely no reason at all, basically. This was a picture at Auschwitz of workers marching out, going to work, and then coming back, being serenaded by a band, but they're carrying uh, the people who had died or were uh, uh, too sick to walk. And uh, they were being systematically uh, starved as they 
uh, would work when they got too exhausted, then of course they would be uh, they would be killed. These are Roma or gypsies that are marching into Auschwitz. They went right to the gas uh, chambers. Uh, Roma are the new names for gypsies. Uh, people in the past thought they came from Egypt, such and they, therefore the name gypsies. They really come from part of uh, India. And uh, I remember in Marathon City, uh, gypsies coming every summer with their big trucks so really overloaded with all kinds of merchandise and parking out by Scotch Creek, just west of, uh, of Marathon. And my mother saying, don't go out there, they kidnap children. And I didn't believe it then, and I really wanted to go out, and I kind of wish I had now. I would have loved to see that gypsy camp. The Jewish people in this picture are headed to the gas chamber, and it's just kind of eerie looking at the faces of people who pretty well know uh, what's going to happen to them. And this is a picture, actual picture of workers uh, doing some work at, uh, at Auschwitz in Birkenau. Ashes collected from the cremation ovens. Uh, uh, they collected just a few, but it is in honor of, of those who uh, died and were, uh, were burned to death. And the firing execution wall with pockmarked with bullet holes. And you can see people leave flowers for them. We had a Jewish member of our group, a woman, and she could only make it through halfway of the tour and uh, got too emotional and had to, had to quit. Uh, two tons of human hair. Uh, they were packed into sacks and sold to industrialists for production in the hair cloth and felt. And very touched by the, uh, the braided uh, hair that you see there in, in the gold and luggage confiscated from the condemned. Familiar names from around here, Klein, Newman. Uh, don't see any others right now, but uh, you know, that's kind of eerie as well. Ovens we visited, capacity for cremating, 8,000 corpses a day. And they were just going all the time. And it takes a tremendous amount of heat to cremate. Uh, corpse, but they had the uh, industrial uh, capacity to set these up. It was a real industrial process. These are Jewish student groups touring Auschwitz-Birkenau, and you just wonder what their thoughts are. Uh, they had guides along, uh, Jewish uh, leaders who were talking to them as they went through. Uh, this group didn't have it, but many of them had t-shirts saying who they were and where they were from. And this is the railroad line that you would come in if you were in a railroad car and uh, Auschwitz and Birkenau area were uh, con chose because, chosen because uh, it was well connected with railroad tracks. So Auschwitz II or Birkenau, three kilometers from Auschwitz, uh, was destroyed by the retreating Nazis. They tried to cover their tracks, as to say. Uh, but these are the tracks that delivered people to the camp where you see the shunt lines on the right hand uh, uh, shunting off. That's where the uh, boxcars would uh, unload and there would be guards there with their dogs and their whips and they would chase them into the camp. They would be judged on whether they were uh, able to work or not. Uh, they got a uh, reprieve for the time that they were able to work. Others went right straight to the uh, gas chambers. and overcrowded three-tier bunks, very uncomfortable, especially for people on the bottom as uh, many people got dysentery and all kinds of diseases. And uh, uh, you might imagine what, what could happen. And here's a picture of them being occupied by people. And uh, all of these people would have been killed. The Camp Johns were used as torment as well. They had 10 minutes and there was more uh, inmates were put in, then there were holes. And so when you thought maybe you would have some relief and uh, you were hurried along and if you weren't finished, you were finished and you had to leave. It was uh, just another form of uh, demeaning, humiliation and torture used by the Nazi regime. The Wieliska uh, salt mine was uh, Interesting place. I wasn't sure about going to a salt mine, but it is the oldest business in Poland. Over a million visitors per year. 
and it's on the UNESCO World Cultural and Natural Heritage list. So that got my interest up. And here is the lift. You go down a thousand feet into the salt mine. And when you get down there, the chapel of St. Kinga, the patron of Saint of Miners, 20,000 tons of rock salt were removed to make this chamber. And everything in the chamber is made of salt, and that includes the chandeliers. So here are the altarpieces, the carvings, the balustrade, everything is made from salt. Miners created all of the sculptures, and those are salt sculptures. Are you worth your salt? Well, salt at one point uh, was used uh, to pay people in the, in the Roman army. Salt was so valuable, it was their salary. Salt comes from salary. And uh, uh, it's, even in the Middle Ages, it was so valuable because you had to preserve meat. There was no refrigeration, and salt was very, very uh, uh, valuable. And so are you worth your salt? It means, well, you know, are you, are you really worth a lot of money? Are you worth the effort that uh, we're putting into you? And if you should spill salt, well, the devil made you do it. So you pick a pinch of salt and you throw it over your shoulder because that will get the devil in the eye. He pushed you into spilling the salt. And so uh, uh, you're punishing the devil for doing that. All kinds of those kind of little comments about salt. We also saw Polish folk dancers, which we don't have to travel to Poland for. We can see that right around. I did as a kid going around to Popular Tree, uh, River River Ballroom, Schmitz, uh, and going to the wedding dances. There was always a lot of polka dances going on. However, here you see them dressed in their local finery from each village and each district has their own uh, particular designs. Polish dances include the Polonaise, the Mazurka, and the Polka. They actually originated in the Czech parts of the land, so, uh, but it's been borrowed and used mightily by the, the Polish people. This guy is riding a horse. He's got a hobby horse there and he's riding around much to the amusement of the women we're looking on. Beautiful small shops. You know, just, I don't know if you can see the dragonfly hanging down from the, in between the two buildings, but kind of quirky little uh, statues here and there. And uh, it just adds to the, uh, the charm of the place. And this is what I like to do. I like to sit and have coffee with uh, friends and I just chat and you can see they're having a good time. And uh, I cannot understand Polish whatsoever, so uh, I just could not uh, sit down and have a chat with them. So Joyce and I left this tour that we were on, and uh, we got on a train and went up to Gdansk. And uh, that is the former Danzig, the former German city in the uh, uh, north that was on the Polish corridor. And of course, the Germans were removed from that, uh, that area. This uh, area, Gdansk, uh, was part of Pomerania. And this is when a lot of the uh, uh, Pomeranians had to leave because they were pushed out by the Polish people, not only Gdansk, but then as you go west through what was known as Pomerania. And uh, as a result, uh, we have many po Pomeranians here in in Marathon County. We have one of the largest Pomeranian organizations anywhere in the world right now. So our hotel was across from the uh, sign, Gdansk, that showed on the, on the river. Oops, we're going the wrong direction. And across the other direction was the Museum of World War II, just opened in 2017. Beautiful architecture. Uh, the past is underground, the present is at ground level, and the tower is the future. And uh, it's, it's one of the state of art. Uh, Gdansk has two of the real state of art uh, uh, museums I've seen anywhere. Uh, just, just really fantastic. And part of it is here, we see the flag of Poland under the Soviet Union. You see the crown on the top of the head of the White Eagle. The Soviet Union removed the crown. It has now been restored. So Poland is now a sovereign country again. And uh, just kind of subtle little symbolic stuff, but 
symbolism means a lot. Of course, one of the, uh, the worst moments in Polish history was in Molotov and Ribbentrop uh, signed their pact in 1939, dividing Poland between the Soviet Union and, and Germany. So how would you like that? You know, we're between Canada and Mexico. Uh, and we're big and powerful, of course. And, uh, but being small and vulnerable and then having Hitler and the Nazis on one border and Stalin and the communists uh, on the other border, uh, both uh, coveting your land, not a comfortable place to be in. A couple of their statues, we're going through the museum a little bit here. Uh, Josef Pilsudski, uh, often arrested for being anti-Russian, and uh, he formed an army to fight for Polish independence. And in 1920, after the World War I, Russia, the new Soviet Union, uh, wanted to get Poland back. So they sent the Red Army to take over Poland, and Pilsudski uh, defeated them uh, right before Warsaw in the Miracle on the Vistula. So again, a very powerful military figure. And Ignacy uh, Paderewski, who I think maybe some of you have heard as a, a concert pianist and a composer. Uh, he was also a national politician and spokesman for Poland at Versailles Conference, demanding that there be a Poland at the end of the war. And he was the leading, took a really leading role in the uh, government in exile during World War II as well, and that was in Britain. Well, the German Enigma machine was a secret code machine that was used by the Nazis, and they thought it was absolutely foolproof. Nobody could uh, decode that. Well, Pol Polish mathematicians cracked the code in 1939, and uh, later some of these uh, mathematicians will escape to, to England. But the later credit for cracking the code goes to British code breakers. In fact, there's been... Uh, uh, public television, there was a series a while back about Betchley Park, in which it was glorifying the work of the code breakers there. But uh, you rarely ever hear of the Polish code breakers. Uh, here was the division, uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union split up Poland. Uh, during World War II, Poland had 5.6 million deaths. It's military and civilian, uh, out of 35 million people. That's a high percentage. Germany had 6 million deaths, soldiers and civilians, out of a population of 80 million. So who suffered the most? The United States had 418,500 uh, uh, deaths and uh, uh, wasn't quite in the same category of losses as these kind of countries. So Poland was a land of blood, and uh, it was because Nazi Germany and Soviet Union split it. Then Nazi Germany fought against the uh, Soviets as they attacked in 1941. And then the Soviet Union, of course, attacked and, and drove the Nazis back through Poland uh, in 44. So uh, the war rages uh, back and forth across Poland. And this poor kid is sitting wondering why. Hitler's long-term goal for Poland was Lebensraum for the Germans and extermination of the Poles. Uh, Poland uh, means land of fields, and it's, he needed those fields for German farmers. So uh, the outlook for, uh, for Poland uh, under Nazi rule was not, not good. The Soviets under Stalin deported or killed much of the intellectual and military leadership of the Polish territory in their sphere, and there's a picture of Stalin, probably responsible for more deaths than any other dictator, possibly rivaled by Mao Zedong. And part of this was uh, back in 1940, when they split the country between the Nazis and the Soviets. Uh, the Soviet Union gathered 22,000 Polish military officers and executed them and buried them in Katyn forest, and then tried to cover it up, but historians uh, uh, discovered the uh, the act and the deed. And 
So this is part of the museum as well. The Warsaw Uprising ended with the destruction of Warsaw with the Red Army looking on. And here you have a tank and a beat up uh, uh, it's, uh, buildings around with rubble and everything to make it look realistic. But you actually are in the museum. It's quite an exhibition. There's lots of amber for sale. Joyce went and she wanted to buy some amber. So we're looking in an amber store. You can see the red and the gold and the almost yellow. And uh, the kind of snake uh, made out of amber and so forth. You can buy almost anything of amber there. And we went to this old workshop and talked to the guy who was working with the uh, jewelry. He said, after a storm on the Baltic, people go up to the seaside and they find amber that's washed up on the beach. And of course, amber is just really the sap of, uh, uh, of uh, the trees that uh, harden over time and sometimes capture insects on the inside and sticky. And, and uh, so uh, it's, those are more valuable pieces if you can see through them. And if there is an insect in them, then they're, uh, they're more expensive. How do you know if it's genuine amber? Well, you can light it and it'll burn. Probably not to be done with your more valuable pieces, but uh, that is one way you can discover genuine amber. Well, Gdansk's history was is a major seaport on the Baltic, and the Hanseatic League German uh, traders uh, set up a port here, uh, the Teutonic Knights, you may have heard of, uh, as main outlet for trade in Polish grain. So these uh, Farmers would sell their grain to the Teutonic Knights, who then would take it down into uh, ports in Europe for sale. This is St. Mary's Basilica, the largest brick church in the world. It can hold 25,000 people, 31 chapels. In 1981 to 83, the first rebellion of the Solidarity Union, uh, which failed, uh, members of the Solidarity Union sought refuge in this church. As we've mentioned, uh, the Pope was opposed to communist control, and so the church and the unions are making common cause. Mariska uh, Street uh, was rebuilt with the original materials. In other words, they picked up the ruins and uh, cleaned off the bricks and the stone and used the original materials to rebuild this uh, street. Up and down the street, you can see little stalls where people are selling things, and that's uh, usually amber that they're selling there. Well, this is the Polish post office in Gdansk, in Danzig. Back when World War I started out, uh, the Nazis, uh, when they were starting the war, sent soldiers here to take over the post office, and 100 Polish postal worker workers held out for hours. And uh, there was a PBS uh, show not long ago. I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, but it did have scenes from inside the post office during this attack. It was kind of interesting. Uh, all the members who survived uh, were taken out and, and were executed. So they didn't survive. The uh, major part of the war it begins at Vesterplot, which is just outside of... Uh, uh, Gdansk, it's on a small island uh, into the harbor, when the German battleship, the Schleswig-Holstein, shelled the Polish garrison and uh, Nazi troops attacked. And you can see all the arrows leading into this island, which had a, uh, a Polish army uh, fortress. And uh, uh, they held out for quite a long time. And, uh, oops. Went the wrong direction. Here's a guardhouse that was destroyed by shell fire and bombing. And fighting raged on around this area. And it raged on for days. And Hitler was furious. He said it should have taken three or four hours to take this place. And as a result, the Schleswig Holstein was sent on patrol in the Arctic uh, to punish the crew and the, uh, the boat itself, I suppose, and certainly the captain, uh, because they didn't do the job as quickly as and efficiently as Hitler had thought they should. Uh, these are the uh, uh, burial plots for the uh, Polish resistance, uh, the soldiers who had died uh, fighting to defend Westerplot. And these are students that are out there on their uh, doing their uh, duty to the community. 
uh, they're cleaning, washing the uh, uh, tombstones and the in the area and sweeping the uh, area as well. And uh, it's a very touching uh, memorial to those soldiers. So this is one of my favorite photographs because I'm able to catch the rainbow over the shipyard Gdansk. And this is where the revolt against uh, communism begins. And I don't know if you can see it, but over by the A and Gdanska, uh, there is a secondary uh, rainbow as well. So uh, if you, I don't know if it comes across that clear, but if it does, uh, it's a picture I like a lot. And the free city of Danzig under the Germans, this was a major port for Germany. And it was a fish area, yeah, shipbuilding uh, area as well. And uh, they built submarines here, and they had a submarine yard that uh, where they would send the submarines out. So this was a busy seaport and a shipbuilding, a submarine building, shipyard. What do they build there today? Well, if you have a moderately uh, rich uh, bank account, they produce uh, high-tech modern yachts. And they also refit yachts to make them high-tech. So if your yacht is getting a little old, it doesn't have all the high-tech electronics that you would like, uh, just take it to Gdansk and they'll do a good job for you. The full name of the Solidarity Union was the Independent Self-Governing Labor Union, and it was of shipbuilders. And the three crosses, the tall columns there, are crosses, uh, were a monument to the workers who gave their lives in the shipyard strikes. And it's a brand new uh, museum right behind them to this whole uh, uh, solidarity movement. And it's made of uh, ship plate and it's been left to rust. And so uh, it, it has kind of a rusty uh, ship look to it and it's brand new. Anna Volantovich uh, was the crane operator at the Lemon Shipyards, who was fired. And that set off a strike in 1981, I think it was. And uh, uh, she was the co-founder of Solidarity. You know, we hear of Lech Valenza all the time. Anna, we do not hear about. A little gender bias, possibly. Uh, even her picture is fading from the, uh, the poster here. So Lech Valenza was born in my year that I was born, 1943. It was a good year for uh, producing uh, labor union uh, activists. Uh, not that I was one. Uh, he was arrested many times, uh, unemployed electrician, and he wasn't there when the 80s strike began. And he jumped over the back wall and took over as chairman of the strike. So he was well known and people uh, saw him as, as a leader. There had been previous uh, uprisings in Poland, 1956-68, labor unrest, strikes. They were put down by military power. And in 1981-83, solidarity uh, was outlawed and leaders were jailed. And uh, it's not until 1989 that solidarity wins out and is legalized. So you can go through all the different periods here. The moment of decision, who is this man? Well, if you look on the bottom, it's Gary Cooper. And uh, he is wearing a solidarity white badge above his badge. What's this all about? The movie was made in 1952. Uh, High Noon had uh, four uh, uh, bandits who were coming into town to take out the sheriff. So Gary Cooper, being the sheriff, goes around and talks to many of the townspeople. Will you back me up? And they all give a frightful, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. So as he finds out, tick tock, tick tock, the clock is always in the background going tick tock. Uh, we're moving to noon and he has no support in the city. His wife is a pacifist and she doesn't like killing. And she said, you don't know this town any." anything they're not going to back you up let's just put drop your badge on the uh, desk and uh, let's get out of here but he's got this sense of duty and 
Uh, I don't know if you remember Gary Cooper at all, but he had a very tense, tight look to him, and you could see the sweat forming on his upper lip. And uh, the tick-tock, tick-tock brings you to noon. And so he goes out. And in the gunfight, he shoots two of the guys right away. And then uh, in his ensuing battle, he actually gets the third one, but the fourth one has him in his sights with a rifle. And uh, that's going to be the end of the movie in a tragic sense. When his wife comes around the corner with, she had taken his shotgun out and she shoots the fourth bad man. And uh, then uh, uh, he walks in, to, drops his uh, badge on the uh, table, resigns as a sheriff, and they leave, they leave town. But uh, what do you do when the time comes and you're reluctant, you're afraid, even if you're a pacifist, when the moment's there, will you stand up to your duty? And uh, apparently to the polls, uh, High Noon and Gary Cooper uh, exemplified that, uh, that uh, kind of quality that uh, they wanted for their people. So here are the 29 demands. Nationwide trade unions should be independent and self-governing, written on plywood. You know, this is not a high-tech deal. It wasn't put in on uh, Facebook or anything. It was put on plywood. It's the way we used to do it in the old days. Well, General Jarolowski, early in the 19 early uh, uh, Solidarity Movement, uh, moved with Polish troops to put down uh, Solidarity and to put uh, Lech Walesa and a lot of the leaders in jail. And he says later, I say Poland, because if I didn't do it, the Soviet Union was going to send in the army and then we would have had a real problem. So uh, he did what he thought he had to do, according to Jarolowski. He was not my favorite character at the time, let me tell you. And, uh, but he established a military coup and military uh, power that ruled until 1989. And during that period, Lech Walesa won the 1983 Nobel Peace Prize. He's in jail, so that is his wife and his two sons. And that's the Peace Prize. So here it is, 1989, Solidarity wins full recognition, and he got his seat negotiating with the government. Uh, the leadership in Poland did ask the Soviet leadership, Mikhail Gorbachev, to intervene and to uh, invoke the Brezhnev Doctrine, which was to say that any country that tried to break away, the Soviet army would come and force them not to. Uh, the Soviet army was deeply involved in where? Afghanistan. And Mikhail Gorbachev told the Pol Polish government, handle it yourself. They could not. There was a general strike throughout Poland. Poland was a total standstill. And so they will uh, give up and recognize uh, solidarity as an independent union. And there is Lech Wałęsa. He's got a huge pen with a picture of the Pope on it. Uh, Marxism being militantly atheistic, uh, he is kind of saying in your face, you know, with that, uh, with that pen. So uh, that was a big moment. Poland is, from that point, pretty much independent. And that was the end of our trip. And there is Pope John Paul II saying goodbye to you and uh, giving you a blessing. So thank you for listening. Yeah, great job. Um, okay, this makes this echo. Okay. Yeah, well, um, thanks, Rick. That was great. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for, for watching as well. Um, at this point, I, I didn't say ahead of time, so I apologize if you, you didn't catch the, the, the messages. But if you have any questions, this is a, a great time for that. We'll have a little time here. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to throw an out, uh, for you right now, um, while we're waiting and again, no, no, no pressure. If you just wanted to come see the, the, the talk, that's cool too. Um, but I, I had a question, um, you know, in, in the travel that you, you went through, um, and you covered a lot of different areas of, of Polish history. Um, I'm sure that a lot of the, the people that were on the, the trip with you and that you met, like had roots back there, um, 
did you get a sense of that that connection to North America of the you know because obviously this maybe not so much in the northern part of Marathon County but there are parts and you know in our neighboring areas where there's a lot of Polish immigration. Um, I don't know if that just kind of throw that out there as a yeah we actually we did go with a tour group it was Globus. And uh, for the first part of the trip, and uh, they were going to experiment with a Polish trip. They had Polish trips that went through Poland and stopped at at several cities, but this would be only Poland, and it's the first time they were doing it. And they thought they would have uh, enough for maybe four uh, four tours uh, in 2019. They ended up with ten, and huge demand for more. Uh, there's a uh, pent-up demand to uh, to visit Poland, and uh, it just wasn't really available in a uh, you know the popular sense that you can go with a group and and uh, travel in some comfort and and get around that way. I know people could always travel there on their own and they have their own itineraries, but uh, I think this is the start of a big uh, tourist. Uh, uh, event as far as Polish economy is concerned. Uh, it's really a, an interesting and beautiful place to visit. And uh, it's, we didn't visit uh, near all that we would like to see, but uh, we did see some interesting parts, that's for sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that there's a, a big demand for, you know, uh, people going back to see where their family came from. And, and, oh, yeah. Or as, as in some cases, maybe not even their family. Since well, it's a great trip anyway. Pomeranians uh, oh, yeah. lost their, their homes, and Polish people live there now, but if they want to go and see where their ancestors live, they have to go into, uh, many of them have to go into Poland to, uh, to find where those villages are, and they will not find uh, hardly any Pomeranians living there. It'll be Polish people. That makes sense. Um, well, I think, I think maybe we'll call it there then. Um, cause I, I don't see any, any questions. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, once again, Rick for, for that, that great trip through Poland, um, and, and the history there. Oh, wait, there's another, another quick question here. Got, got under the wire here. Um, I don't know if it's taking a bit for it to show up in my, my, uh, queue here, but, um, uh, asked how long the trip was and whether you'd recommend visiting with a tour if you went again. Um, how, how long was the, when the, did that end up being? Uh, it was a two-week tour, and then we took a... It wasn't quite two weeks, but then we took a week and went up uh, to Gdansk. And, and I would definitely not miss Gdansk. Uh, that's, that's really an interesting part of the trip. It all depends on your comfort level. I traveled alone a, a lot of years until my wife uh, retired and... Now we travel uh, together. She likes to know where we're going to eat and sleep. So uh, we uh, travel by tour now, and I, I enjoy it. But I, I, in more adventurous years, I would uh, travel a place like this alone and, and uh, investigate. So uh, it all depends on your style and your uh, style of comfort. Uh, you know, what, uh, what kind of places are you going to Are you going to stay in a hostel? Are you going to stay in a five-star hotel? There's so many different ways of traveling, so you have to decide what you can afford and what you would like, and then uh, to investigate to see the way of fulfilling those uh, those dreams of travel. But by all means, go. Uh, Poland is a fascinating place, and I would just recommend to go. And uh, the more time you can spend there, and the wider the areas that you can go to, the greater your experience will be. That's that's for sure. So, yeah, great. Um, yeah, and then she followed up saying that they're they're hoping to go in twenty twenty two. So yeah, hopefully, the um, everything will have recovered enough. I know that the last year hasn't been great for international tourism, but yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully we see it recover from that. We're headed to uh, Panama in January, so we're starting again as well. We were supposed to be going across Canada by train this summer. Mm -hmm. But uh, Canada was closed, and if you got to Canada, then you couldn't get back. So, yeah. so we postponed that until next next summer. But uh, January 22 is our, our first 
international trip now for this next year. Well, again, um, I think we'll, we'll call it there. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us and um, have, a, have a wonderful rest of your day. And we'll um, talk to you again soon.